أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن ولاه This is our fifth session in the series of التخلية قبل التحلية or purification before beautification and last week we spoke about الهوى and its poisons and we spoke before about العجب we spoke before about so then and there was an introductory session today thursday september 21st of 2017 at the prayer center in orland park we are going to talk about the problems in rushing for results the problem of rushing into results and this is something that has to do with our nature. Al-istajal is linguistically من, من اللغة, from anything that is uh, demanded on the spot, something fast. al to push for something to be right on the spot. And although the um, uh, topic is very wide, we are going to focus mainly about uh, how it applies in Islamic da'wah, bottom line. Uh, we're going to cover other parts, but we are more interested in talking about the idea of da'wah and calling for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how things happen uh, through the concept of istajal or rushing results. And we're going to learn from the experiences of the prophets what happened to them and sahaba too, uh, to the best of our ability, inshallah ta'ala. Now, it is uh, narrated البداية uh, والنهاية for Ibn Kathir he spoke about the creation of Adam alayhi salam and uh, when he was talking about the ayah خلق الإنسان من عجل that the creation of Adam it was made in him that he, he, he likes to rush into things. He's, he always have issues with sabr and patience and applying wisdom. He just wants things to happen on the spot. Now the narration might not be any sahih, but it is said that when the soul was breathed into Adam alayhi salam, into his mind or his body, he wanted, he saw heaven and he saw the you know the things so he wanted to stand up to get that which he wanted but the soul was not yet reaching his legs so he could not stand and that's the understanding of that you like to rush into things without being patient now this nature that is in us Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke about it you know in the Quran al Karim. this ayah actually although it we are relating it to the story of the creation of Adam, but it has a uh, reason for its revelation. It is in Surah Al-Anbiya, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلْ سَأُرِيكُمْ آيَاتِي فَلَا تَسْتَعْجِلُونَ I shall, I shall show you my signs, do not rush it, Allah is saying. And actually this ayah was talking to the believers. The believers started seeing how much the pagans and the kuffar of Quraysh was making fun of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi And they're saying how yani, would this happen to the Prophet, the Messenger of Allah Subhanahu Wa Why would not Allah punish these people? Why would Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala not put them into yani, check and let them see exactly what is the power of Allah? This is your Prophet. Actually, the ayah prior to that explains that. Let me quote the ayah prior to that. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, وَإِذَا رَآكَ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا When the disbelievers see you, O Muhammad, إِنْ يَتَّخِذُونَكَ إِلَّا هُزْوَى They make fun of you. They make all kind of jokes on you. أَهَذَا الَّذِي يَذْكُرُ آلِهَتَكُمْ Is this the one who's mentioning things about your idols and, you know, statues? وَهُمْ بِذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ هُمْ كَافِرُونَ And they are rejecting the attribute of Ar-Rahman. You know Allah's name, Allah, 
The only equivalent name next to it is Ar-Rahman. There's an ayah in the Quran that says that. قُلْ اِدْعُوا اللَّهِ أَوْ اِدْعُوا الرَّحْمَانِ أَيَّمْ مَا تَدْعُوا فَلَهُ الْأَسْمَاءُ الْحُسْنَى So the only name that Allah matched with his you know, name as Allah is Ar-Rahman. So here Allah is saying, وَهُمْ بِذِكْرِ الرَّحْمَانِ That in the remembrance of Allah, Ar-Rahman, هُمْ كَافِرُونَ they are rejecting that. خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلٍ You believers are rushing the punishment of Allah on these disbelievers. You don't know what Allah had planned for the people of Quraysh. He planned for them that they all embrace Islam. So at the time when you were under the, I mean, who could understand that the Mughals or the uh, uh, you know, Tatar who came and invaded the Muslim land and tortured and killed so many of them that they embraced Islam themselves and they became Muslims. You don't know how Allah works with things. And you have to have faith and sabr and work through the, what we call Sunanullah, the, the ways that Allah had set this universe that works on. And you are a follower of a, of a Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam that was meant to be sent to Rahma lil Alameen. You know, today I was thinking about most of the people, why do, uh, why do they act arrogant sometimes or they see some, themselves superior for, for, from others? Because they are full of themselves. And the more you are full of yourselves, you, for yourself, you don't see others are match and you'll be rude, you'll be arrogant, you'll be harsh. The Prophet had every means وسلم, to be any superior. He is the Prophet, but yet he was Rahma lil Alameen. Just this by itself should show you how Allah prepared this Prophet alayhi salam to be a true messenger of him sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And, uh, you know, Tahir al-Ashur, one of the interpreters of the Quran, on this ayah, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلْ says a very beautiful thing. He says, ضَعْفُ صِفَةِ الصَّبْرِ فِي الْإِنسَانِ the lack of patience in you min muqdata at tafkir fil mahabbati wal karahiya it's all related to love and hate the 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 level of sabr if it goes up or down is all depending on love or hate how he says fa idha fakkara al aql fi shay'in mahbub if your mind starts thinking about something you want, you want that car, you want that uh, house, you want that job, you want that marriage, you want whatever, something that you love, you want to rush it because you love it, you want it. If you think of something that you hate, you rush into taking it away because of the hate that you have in you. So it's all coming down to what? How you feel about things. Love. So if you love al-khair and al-hidayah to humanity, this is a, a, a big problem, is that a lot of people don't give themselves, nor the people who are might be, I mean the Prophet had it in his hands, وسلم, rejected, tortured, beaten, forced from his, like his companions forced him, and they, he had to go to a ta'if, kids threw, you know, rocks at him. He sat down and the angel, Jibreel, came with the angel of mountains. And he could have done it that moment. Jibreel came, he said, give me the sign. And I will order, order the angel of mountains to bring down the, the two mountains of the people of Mecca. And what was the Prophet's thought, Sallallahu He was Rahma lil Alameen. These were his people. If we have no hope in this, maybe in the second generation, that someone from their generation will come who will say, La ilaha illallah. It's, it's tough. It's not easy at that moment when you know you are losing everything, when you know that you have the ability to inflict pain on people, and you are in pain, to rise over that and to wish people good. That's one of the toughest things that can come on a human being. And that's something that has to relate to the idea of the problem of rushing into results. 
we are talking about how to weigh options in da'wah of what is best for humanity. And even from the people who cause you harm. I mean, what would the Prophet make dua? The most two vicious people among many that used to hate Islam and Muslims were whom? Umar ibn Khattab and his uncle Khalu, Abu Jahl, Amr ibn Hisham. And what would the Prophet say? Allahumma a'izza al-Islam bi ahad al Umarain. O oh Allah, bring triumph and dignity to Islam by the one of these two people embracing Islam. And subhanAllah, Allah answered his prayer, وسلم. And Allah a'azzal Islam at that moment when Umar took shahada and when he was the Khalifa, like there has never been Izza like the ruling of Sayyidina Umar. Although Abu Bakr, the crucial two and a half years that he ruled, uh, radiallahu ta'ala, were so important to stabilize the Muslim Ummah. But the nourishing and the growth and the establishment of da'wah and the way people embraced Islam and the territories that, was, that were brought to Muslim land were all happening. Actually, everyone built on that which Umar had established, radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So this natural thing in us about al istajal we need to understand that there is two types of it. There is istajal, we call it madhmum, something you should dislike. And there is istajal mahmud, that is something you should acquire. But whenever we talk about al istajal, rushing in general, we always think of the madhmum, of the disliked one. That's the most dominant. But we're going to give examples on both. Now, Sayyidina Musa, take for, for first example. Musa, alayhi salam, of course, when, you know, when the Prophet, وسلم, used to tell Bilal, arihna biha ya Bilal, call for the prayer. He knew how sweet prayer is. When the Prophet ﷺ would stand up and make Qiyam al-Layl until his feet are sore, he knew that even with the pain of the body, what type of spiritual elevation, like something different. Imagine Musa listening to God. How would that feel? Can you encompass the joy or the spiritual elevation that Musa was enjoying? So Musa would go to Jabal al-Tur, talk to Allah. Who has that access and would not want to be just on that mountain day and night? But he had a job. You listen, you come deliver, and you oversee that your people are what? Picking up on that which you delivered to them. You make sure that you establish it properly. Then you go back for what? For more. Musa rushed. He left his people because he was in yani, full faith. He, he missed God in, in, in our language. Yani. He wanted to go back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so he could listen more and enjoy. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told him, وَمَا أَعْجَلَكَ عَنْ قَوْمِكَ يَا مُوسَىٰ Why you are rushing to, to, to leave your people, ya Musa? You should have stayed because the moment when he went back to communicate with God, what happened? The Samari came up and he made for them Al-Ajil to worship. And Musa alayhi salam answered back Allah. And you're going to blame me for what I miss you for? وَعَجِلْتُ إِلَيْكَ رَبِّي لِتَرْضَى I, I cannot be away from you. I want to be with you. I want to hear the, 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 the mighty voice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is something very, you know, but at that moment, priorities, even if you are meant to enjoy this, and this might represent a dose for you to put energy in you and, and lift you up and make you a better, uh, you know, messenger, the one who would deliver things better, but you have a job to take care of your people. And that's exactly what happened. That he wanted to come back to his Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he said, You know, they are, you know, following you up. They're gonna follow. I came to your pleasure, my Lord. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala answered him back. But go back to your people. They have been tested. And you have a job to go and do your best and teaching them that which we had what taught you to do. 
Yunus alayhi salam and his story, Jonah, what did he do? He delivered the message and his people rejected and he rushed into conclusion that these people are not receptive anymore. So he left and the story goes about, you know, being on a boat and that the, you know, waves came, the wind, whatever, and they had some sort of a raffle to pull the name of the one that he's going to cause all this and it would come on Yunus alayhi salam. فالتقمه الحوت you know the, the whale uh, had him and فنادى في الظلمات you know لا إله إلا أنت سبحانك إني كنت من الظالمين so he rushed into a judgment on his people that they are not receptive to that which has been brought as honor and this is acceptable as an ishtihad but the stories were all brought to, to, to teach us that even prophets were raised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to learn the experience. Because you're going to say, okay, these people are rejecting it. Let me go invest in someone else. I'm not going to waste my time here. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching that your most uh, worthy people of your da'wah are your own qawm, your own people. And we're not talking about al-qawm. We are American citizens. Our qawm is the public. So... I need to look at them with rahma, with intention that I want khair for them. So this language of hate and this language of wishing them harm, like some people like to you know, promote, this is not the, tra the tradition uh, that we learn in, in our Quran and the, tra the track of the Prophet ﷺ. Always the Quran, Ya Qawm, Ya Qawm. If there is anything that will bring you and me together, even if it was the blood relationship or if it was the culture, I'm going to use that to relate to you in one way or another. I mean, they were kuffar Quraysh. And Allah described his Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi He was like in a total agony وسلم, inside, processing so much uh, like sadness and sorrow for why these people are not listening to me. فَلَعَلَّكَ بَاخِعٌ يُبَاخِعَ النَّفْسِ Like being very tough on yourself عَلَىٰ أَثَارِهِمْ Following them إِنْ لَمْ يُؤْمِنُوا بِهَذَا الْحَدِيثِ أَسَفَ يعني أَسَفَ is the أَسَف Like the sorrow That was the heart of the Prophet كان in a total sorrow صلى الله عليه وسلم On why these people are rejecting his da'wah عليه الصلاة والسلام And when he had the chance to punish him He did not And when he came conquering Mecca and people from the Muslimin who were so much, yani, uh, you know, took every single uh, uh, memory of, of hurt and punishment and torture that they caused on them. So they stood up and they said, Al -yawma -yawmul malhama. Today is the day of slaughtering. We have the power, we're going to come and revenge. And if they had done that, and the culture at that time is the norm, I mean, even now. I mean, even our president, Trump, he's willing to wipe all North Korea. Kids and elderly and insects and bacteria and animals. He's just, we're going to wipe it all. What kind of language is this? It's a language that someone doesn't have mercy to people. He's only thinking of himself. But the Prophet ﷺ told his people who wanted to revenge because of that which has been inflicted on them before, it is not Yawmul Malhama. Al Yawma Yawmul Marhama. This is the day of Rahma. And he, he, he used another adjective of it, Marhama, not just Rahma. Marhama, like you extend it, you know, from one place to another. <coughs> so, rushing into Dawah decisions that you turn away from, he, he, he kept with his uncle, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, until he died. Just say it. I mean, <laughs> At least say it. I will tell my Lord, Ya Rabbi, you know, it came out from his mouth. But he wanted to die, as the narration states, on the millah of his parents and his grandparents and his ancestors. And this is what we want to make sure that, you know, when you are talking about istajal, there is also another area of rushing into results that you need to keep in mind. When... There was much torture on the Sahaba. We know the story of the Sahabi Khabbab ibn al-Arat radiallahu ta'ala anhu. He came and he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sitting with the, 
you know, his back to the Kaaba. And he said, Ala tad'u lana. Ala tastansiru lana. Make dua that Allah, I mean, you are the Prophet. And Allah will answer your dua. So if you say, let us do it today, but the Prophet in you, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that changing a community doesn't happen overnight. Changing a community needs a phase. You don't want to cash something on the spot and it flips the second day. You want people to believe and be carriers so the generation continues and that which you brought. And if he had rushed into cashing some people and the people told him from Mecca, but the Masari, you know, we'll give you money. Do you want to be in power? They said, listen, let us worship God once, one year, and you worship our gods one year. He could have fell them for okay, let me, you know. <laughs> he could have played a game with them. Let us worship God, Allah, the first year, and then he will be in power, and then that's it, he will take. But he knew that this method, which is istajal, it will cash for him what he wanted to do, but it will not last. Because it was earned in an improper way. He wanted people to believe for the, the, the concept of belief. Not because he has power. And that's why those people who, you know, want to rush into uh, judgment on people who don't practice. I mean, we come to the masjid, we see a sister who's not muhajjaba, like every sister, every sister I will be looking at her like eating her up. I mean, if she took the chance to come to the masjid, shouldn't you be welcoming? You should be going out and bringing people who are in bars and nightclubs. That's what we should be doing. And we should be happy when people come, even with their, all their, you know, uh, yani shortcomings or, or uh, lack of practicing Islam. When we see someone coming to the masjid with a gold, you know, ring in his finger, like, or a silsal, you know, like a necklace, like, Oof, hada. and when someone who lived with his wife, both are not practicing, at the age of 30 or 40, Allah had, you know, he embraced Islam, and he started practicing, then he wants to pull his wife and his kids overnight on practicing Islam the same level that he is. Tabanta took you 35 years to pick it up. Give some time for your family to believe in it too. Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala an Aisha, when the Prophet came back into Mecca and they conquered it, she said, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you demolish Al-Kaaba and rebuild it the way it was at the time of Ibrahim? Because when Quraysh built it after the, uh, when the Prophet was young, he did help with it, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He did help in the, there was like some sort of a flood or something. What they did, like the Kaaba used to have two doors. You enter from one and exit from one. And both doors were by the floor, by the ground. So what Quraysh did, they closed the other door and they kept only one door and they made a high door with the stairs so they will only make enter whoever they want. Alaykum salam. So Aisha radiallahu ta'ala and she's saying, Ya Rasulullah, why don't you demolish the Kaaba and rebuild it the way it was at the time? I mean, that's something very proper. I mean, he's a prophet, sallallahu he has all the authority and he's bringing it to the a uh, humble status that everyone should have access to enter the Kaaba. And what the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. If it wasn't that your people, Ya Aisha, are still fresh from Kufr, I would have done it. They're not going to understand it. Even they are Muslims. And they embrace Islam. And they are Sahaba. But there is years of shirk that they were in and they need time to pick up on what? On the practices that Islam came with. Even Sharia came in Tadarruj. You know? So I don't know why all these dua today, like, you know, they want to change the world overnight and they do not want to... Inv we are Hadithi Ahad be, uh, you know, uh, call it colonialism. We are Hadithi Ahad, call it by, uh, you know, Shul Ra'is Mali Adib al Capitalism. We are Hadithi Ahad by uh, being, you know, 
controlled by the West and the Muslim countries. There is this 150 years of Muslim land that has been ruled with no Islamic you know, practice. So you're not going to come and judge people because they're not practicing Islam. Oh, hadala kuffar. These are fusaq. They don't know better. You have to have rahmah for them. You have to see that they are a potential call for da'wah for you. And not to rush on judgment on them. And trust me, if you have that intention, Wallah, he will bring them. But the way you look at people, the way you talk to people, there's a difference between I'm coming to talk to a brother or a sister who, who's not practicing. Look at this person. Astaghfirullah al-Azim. Ad'ajhannam wa la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. How he, he's going to give you his ear and listen to you? Man, they already made a judgment on him. Or this sister, look at her, you know, pants, how it is tied. She goes to the beach. She, she did not know better than that. She was raised differently. And we are in the position of introducing Islam the proper way, incorporating in our conscience that their background, how they were raised, it wasn't... It wasn't the way we were raised probably or the way the guidance that came to us it did not kick into them yet. We have to incorporate that in our mind. So the Prophet was telling Khabbab radiallahu ta'ala and who was rushing into the change of the status of Mecca. He's saying, listen, during this period when Islam is going to come to people's life, there's going to be a lot of sacrifices. And you as followers, you're going to have to pay the price. Man, that's the way it is. Mafi. Yani people are not going to embrace Islam on a silver plate. There's a lot of people are going to be putting their lives on the, yani, uh, uh, on the line for that. And then he started telling him about how the people before used to do. People will be brought, put in some ditches, and then some, uh, uh, you know, comes, from, comes made from hadith like metal would, will take their, their flesh out, and then the Saw will be brought and they will be split into two pieces. وَمَا كَانَ ذَلِكَ يعني لِيَرُدَّهُمْ أو uh, you know, to, to, to the, uh, the, distract them away from the path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he tells him, وَالَّذِي نَفْسُ مُحَمَّدٍ بِيَدِهِ By the one whom Muhammad's soul in his, is in his hand. لَيُتِمَّنَّ اللَّهُ هَذَا الْأَمْرِ This matter shall be complete until you will see someone traveling from Yemen to Kaaba fearing no one but Allah and maybe the wolves or the beasts on their sh uh, you know sheeps but you are rushing into results so you have to understand that it doesn't matter whom you deal out with when you are calling for the da'wah of Islam patience patience they hurt you patience they talk about you patience they make fun of you patience you have to have that the Prophet was that. And the Sahaba was asking Allah, you know, asking the Prophet to make dua that Allah, Allah destroy them. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is answering back that He knows what we know not. That what Allah planned for the people whom they wished to be destroyed, they all became Muslims and they carried Islam to the world later on. If you can just incorporate, incorporate that. Just to keep up with time. Time. <coughs> when you are talking about al-istajal, knowledge and this is a huge mushkila these days someone sits down three, four classes of Sheikh Kifah goes online and listen a couple video tapes of Nu'man Ali Khan you know, opens a book and read the seerah of the Prophet through Tariq Ramadan and mashallah Mawlana wa Sheikhna wa Ukhna starts all being mashayikh you know, in Arab tradition, they used to say, Al-ilmu thalathatu ashbar. Knowledge is like three yards or three um, feet or like three segments. Man alima shibr al-awwal takabbar. If you take the first segment and you stop there, you're going to end up arrogant. Because you're going to get knowledge others don't have yet. And you're going to see yourself, oh, I know, I can add, I can do this. So you're going to use that knowledge actually to feed it into yourself and in, into your ego rather than to what? To benefit people. And then he said, they say, وَمَنْ عَلِمَ الشِّبْرَ الثَّانِي 
people who learn the second segment of knowledge, tawada. From takabbar, if you go more, the more you learn, if, if, if the, the journey of knowledge is three parts, if you take the first part only, you're going to end up arrogant. If you take the second part, you're going to be humble. Because you know at that time how beautiful this knowledge is and how it should make you cash it into your character. قال ومن علم الشبر الثالث One who learns the third segment علم أنه لا يعلم شيئا He will land on the fact that he knows nothing. Because exactly وما أوتيت من العلم إلا قليلا I mean go even in sciences. Go to people who are in chemistry or in biology or in physics. Every time they explore something new, they just know how much that they did not know before. And it's like a new horizon out there that you know, puzzles them. I mean, we had what? Telescopes until we got Hubble telescope. And then we, we started seeing what we were like unaware of. We just don't know nothing. I mean, can you imagine? Have you ever been to the... Uh, what's the name of the... Uh, Shusmuhada live downtown al museum planetarium planetarium Adler planetarium they have this uh, movie or like they have it they show you earth and how is earth to sun and how is sun to this i mean just go like 6 7 galaxies <laughs> like no, earth is nothing it's, it's, not, it's like a cell it's like a cell imagine a cell in your body. How big is that? Imagine you on earth. Who are you? Ishanta. <laughs> Nothing. And we are full of ourselves. And we have orders. And we get angry. Easy man. Take it easy. You are nothing. You are only something by God. If you disconnect yourself from God. Then you are nothing so you have to understand that you need to sit down and start opening these yellow pages of old books and getting tired the same and i gave this example before but i wanna i wanna repeat it when this young man came to me from uic and he had collected a whole notebook about misconception about islam he's a muslim kid and he said like he came he said i just need like you know half an hour from the time we end up sitting for almost two hours Question after question. Question after everything that you can think about, misconception about Islam, he had it said. From women to jihad to food to all this ahadith that, you know, the, the, the fly and dip, name it. So after, alhamdulillah, I answered him. He said, thank you, Sheikh. <coughs> Any advice for me? I said, how long it took you to collect all this? He said, two years. And he said it so proud. That, you know, I thought, he thought I'm going to give him credit. <laughs> I said, you spent two years in the intention of looking at misconceptions. Can you spend six months in the intention of learning? Because the approach differs. Because when you want to learn, you humble yourself. You know that you are a student. Talib ilm. And the student who is looking for knowledge will be يعني, in a humility status. The more you know, the more you should be God conscious. إِنَّمَا يَخْشَ اللَّهَ مِنْ عِبَادِهِ الْعُلَمَاءُ Ulama, scholars who know the most, are the most that should be God conscious. Because they know who are they in this universe and what God is to them. أَهْلًا وَسَهْلًا Hadi, what's, what's the name of it? What kind of bug is this? See, it doesn't climb on my hand. I don't know why. <laughs> look, look. I'm bothering her. Ya Allah, Allah my. <laughs> anyway. When people want to rush into, uh, uh, you know, answering their dua, the Prophet Sallallahu said, لا يزال يستجاب للعبد ما لم يدعو بإثم أو قطيعة ما لم يستعجل 
Allah will answer you as long as you don't make a dua in haram like you cause people harm or to disconnect with family members that you should be in good relationship with them or be rushing the answers Sahaba said وَمَا istajan." How would someone be, I mean, everyone wants, when you raise your hand, you want God to answer you. How would I be rushing, you know, my answer? He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, yaqul da'awtu falam yustajab li. I made a dua and Allah did not answer me. Now Allah tasked you with dua. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ ادْعُونِي This is your part. You are tasked with dua. And then he left it for himself. Astajib. Lakum. On his terms, not on yours. On his knowledge, not on yours. On his wisdom, not on yours. Yaqub asked Allah to join him with Joseph, with Yusuf. And Allah delayed it 40 years. 40 years. But when he answered him, he joined him with all his kids back honored in Egypt. So have trust in what Allah has planned, what to answer and what not to answer and what to delay and what not to delay. And this idea of istajal, focus on your part which is ibadah. وَقَالَ رَبُّكُمْ ادْعُونِي That's your task, that's your ibadah. And if Allah doesn't answer you at all, that's even beautiful. Because the Prophet in another hadith said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that all this dua will be saved as hasanat for you at the day of judgment. And people at the day of judgment would wish that none of their dua was answered. Because at that time, it is the currency, hasanat, you want it. So you'd wish, I wish, you know, none of my, how desperate are you? And, you know, I make sab'een istikhara. You don't need to make sab'een istikhara. One is enough. And you're not going to see like a nice dream with some clouds and birds singing. And I don't know where people come up with this. Like they feel Allah is going to talk to them in dreams. Allah will not communicate with you in dreams. Unless he wishes on his own subhanahu wa ta'ala. Dua is your ibadah. To ask Allah to guide you to the best decision. Your decision should be based on your homework. On your investigation. On checking things out. And then when you make the dua, you ask Allah to put the best choice in that which you make. Of course, you cannot make istikhara in haram. You know, you cannot make istikhara, shall I play the lado tomorrow or no? It's like 800 million, you know, maybe. So if, it's, if, if, if the istikhara is in halal, then anything you choose is halal. So then you are only using your what? Your uh, investigation or your investment in the best thing you are going to do. Tayyip. Also, people, I mean, talking about istajal al-ibadah, talking about istajal making money. You know, al-ibadah. You have to take your time in your ibadah. The hadith of the Sahabi who came and prayed to rak'at and sat. So the Prophet ﷺ said, go pray, you did not pray. So he stood up, he prayed to rak'at and then he sat down. Go pray, then he did not pray. He stood up and he prayed the third time. The Prophet told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, go pray. He said, Allim ya Rasul, I don't know. This is what I have. Teach me. And then the Prophet told him, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, that you have to have tuma'anina, tranquility. When you make ruku' when you make sujood, you cannot rush in your salah. So, to cash the prayer, to cash fasting, to cash hajj, to cash all the acts of worship for you in the proper way that it should make difference in your life, you should not rush it in a way that it will take it out from the purpose it was meant to be serving. To enjoy it first and that to let it, you know, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ When you uh, introduce yourself to the area of khushu' you can cash the salah. Listen to this story. Ali رضي الله تعالى عنه وكرم الله وجهه entered the masjid once. There was a man standing by the door of the masjid. Azhar Hadullah with troublemakers. So Ali said, Hold my mule for me. Amsik alayya baghlati. 
probably he wanted to pray and come back out. He said, hold the rope of this, you know, the, 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 the baghla, like the mule. And I'm going to go in and then come out. And then Ali went, radiallahu ta'ala, to the masjid. He stepped out. He found no man and the rope and the saddle taken out from the baghla, stolen. You know, and the guy ran away with them. So Sara'u, he stole from Sayyidina Ali. So what did Ali do? He had two dirhams in his hand. He wanted to donate it to this person as a thank you. Just because he carried one. He held the baghla for him. And then he, ran, he, he, he managed to be on it. And he gave the two dirham for one of his servants to go buy a new saddle. He went and he bought the rope and the saddle from that same man. He didn't know whom he was with the two dirham. So Ali said, subhanAllah, if that guy had waited, he would have got the two dirham without engaging in haram. Rizq rahayusallak. If you are meant to get it, whatever Allah destined for you to earn, will get it. You choose to bring it yourself in halal or in what? Or in haram. Tayyip. Let's go on the other side of al-istajal al-mahmud, the proper one, that Allah tells us to Act on that. Pay your debts. A dain. You should rush into paying your dain. The Prophet وسلم, before money used to come to the Bayt Mal al Muslimin, he would not even pray on people who died with dain on them unless someone comes and say, I take his loan and I pay it. Because you don't want to stand in front of the Day of Judgment with loan on your back, with people. And only until he started having money like from battles, whatever, that he would pay the money on, 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 on their behalf so he could pray on them and make rahmah for them, sallallahu alayhi wa in his prayer. So this is something you should not wait. You know, we have something like in Arabic, we say, a guy came and said, told the person, Give me $1,000. I need, you know, to borrow from you $1,000. He said, you know, kiss my hand. Why insult me? He said, I'm going to kiss your feet by the time you're going to give it back to me. So, let, you know, let us do it from now. At least take of them some dignity. There are people who, in the business of taking money and money, and like they go to everyone, and they have intention not to pay it back. Whoever takes money, there's a hadith actually in that, with the intention of paying it back, sidqan, like honestly and genuine feeling, Allah will help him pay it back. If you are sadiq, Allah will give you means to do that. But one of the things that you should make istajal in life is what? Pay your debt. If someone died, make sure you bury him. Don't delay in that. Ikramul mayyiti, dafnu. To honor that person is to bring him to where he belongs. If a nice man came to ask for the, your daughter's hand, do not delay it. If you're okay with his deen, if you're okay with his akhlaq, and they like each other, as the, the Prophet ﷺ used to tell the Sahabi, انظر إليها, look at her, فَإِنَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَنْ يُؤْدَمَ بَيْنَكُمَا you're going to live next to her for the rest of your life. So look at her to feel that this is someone you can wake up next to for the rest of your life. So this matter of what we call chemistry now. So if there is deen, there is khuluq, and there is chemistry between the two, the father should not delay the marriage. Because illa taf'alu, if you don't act on that, takun fitna. You're going to cause a lot of fitna. And you're going to open the door for what? For haram. Marriage, if the proper candidate comes, should not be what? Should not be delayed. General good deeds, in general, should not be delayed. The Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Badiru bil amali, act on good deeds before seven things will invade you. There are going to be seven things that are going to come to you and delay you from acting on good on good deeds. Hal tan are you waiting until you are becoming poor? 
faqran munsiya because if you lose money if you lose wealth you're going to be busy just trying to make you know your, your, your income to support yourself you're not going to have time for da'wah and ibadah etc etc aw ghinan mutghiya or when you are too wealthy you're going to be busy collecting more money and managing your wealth so you're not going to focus on your da'wah and ibadah aw maradan mufsida or illness that's going to disrupt you from engaging the da'wah aw haraman mufannida or being old until you cannot move aw mawtan mujhiza or death that will cut it short for you aw dajjal or the fitna the biggest fitna that will come on the ummah of muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam al awar al dajjal fasharru ghaib yuntadhar that's the worst thing people should yani be thinking of will come aw al sa'a or the day of judgment wa al sa'atu adha wa mar it's like the worst of the scenarios so when you know that badiru bil a'mal act on good deeds you know the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam once he prayed and he made salam and right away he did not sit down for tasbih dhikr whatever he rushed to his ha- to, to to his place and then they, when he came back they said ya rasul allah why did you do that he said i remembered money that i had for sadaqa that these people deserve the sadaqa i should not keep it you know i should give it to them so when you have something that people are in need for you should not you should not block on it and hold on it you should make istijal of tauba you should not delay the tauba when allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says inna at-tawbatu 'ala allah allah will accept the type of tauba lil ladhina ya'maluna as-su'a bi jahala those who engage sins and ignorance not arrogant thumma yatubuna min qareeb the tauba kicks in right after the sin happens which is a sign that your heart is still uh, uh, yani genuine and the first sign of a true tauba is anadam if you do an act of haram and you're okay with it mushkil you want to tell us even when you are doing it you should feel yani bad and you should say oh, Rabbi, whatever i'm weak i'm vulnerable whatever it is if you have that feeling kicking in in, in you during the ma'siyah itself right after the ma'siyah it means your heart is what is still genuine receptive to repentance properly and as the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said anadamu tauba just the act of remorse is tauba by itself you start from there so tauba should not be what should not be delayed also uh let us finish by talking about what are some of the reasons that make people rush into results without investing in things properly the first thing is that you know what we talked about the human nature we spoke we spoke about that we're not going to reiterate that that we by default love to finish things fast but second thing is that lack of knowledge and experience when the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam says man ra'a minkum munkaran falyughayyirhu bi yadihi fa in lam yastati' fa bi lisanihi fa in lam yastati' fa bi qalbihi wa dhalika adhafu al-iman he gave you three dimensions of how you should deal with munkar if you don't study sharia if you don't study the outcome you know like imam sufyan or i'm not sure sufyan al-thawri or another imam he said laysa al-fiqh ma'rifatu al-halal min al-haram True fiqh is not just to know what's halal from haram. It's to know which is less haram is. Akhafil darar. When you master that area that it's easy to know, you know, halal bayin wal haram bayin. But when you have circumstances that both scenarios are bad. And both decisions you're going to make are going to be, you know, uh, causing someone some problem. Then what is the less damaging? What is the last thing that's going to happen to be easy on controlling it after it happens rather taken on something that's very vast you cannot control after so how do you get the knowledge you study the quran you study the series of the prophet now the ones were that we were giving you the examples of them how allah trained his prophets sallallahu alaihi ajma'in to deal with things in the matter of i mean even our prophet sallallahu alaihi because he didn't know 
When Jibreel was teaching him the Quran, what, the, what, he, what was he doing, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He was repeating with him, fearing that he will not remember the Quran. So Allah told him, لا تحرك به لسانك لتعجل به. Don't utter with Jibreel the words. We're going we're gonna to secure it in your heart. Don't worry. So every prophet had an area of experience that he needed to be taught from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then when we see how the prophet learned from that, sallallahu alayhi wa and how he was the role model for the sahaba and directing them in the proper things to do, we need to study the seerah of Rasulullah. First, we need to study the Quran. We need to study the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu we need to study the Quran in what we call Sunanullahi fil Kaun. How Allah set this universe on factors that they, you know, they, they, they work. And these things can people, believers or non believers, can utilize them for their benefit. So you need to master that too. So, knowledge to attain a true hikmah and wisdom when you are making a decision shall I rush here? Shall I practice sabr? Shall I stop? You need to master that in that perspective. Also, uh, you know, your inability to uh, have a thick skin. Yani, like the Sahaba and the, you know, they are rushing into cashing things like the Rumah, the people that Allah, the Prophet set them on the mountain of, you know, in the battle of Uhud. They could not wait on the money. Bottom line, they wanted to take the, you have to have thick skin to tolerate things that might be going against your pleasures and desires and abide with the system. Because the system will cash for you. But they had to lose that battle because they disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ. If they had won Ma'arakat Uhud, history will document that Sahaba disobeyed the Prophet and won and that will never be the case. They had to lose. So history will document that they disobeyed the Prophet, then the price of that is what? Is losing, you know, the battle because you disobeyed the Prophet ﷺ. So you have to have ability to control your desires and, and, and uh, pleasures. So I refer to it as having thick skin to tolerate, to practice sabr and follow the system. If there's a program you should follow, if there is something, you know, you need to uh, go through it, then this is how the phase is going to be. Also, also, uh, hang out with people of experience. I mean, we have a lot of committees, youth, whatever. There has always to be someone older. People who are all in the same age, they can come up with great things. But there is something that you don't have yet, experience. I mean, you might be PhD this, uh, PhD that, but your dad is 20 or 30 years ahead of you in life. He has the PhD of life that taught him a lot of experience that you did not encounter yet. You know, he knew how to raise kids. He knew how to deal with that. So don't cancel people's experiences. Be open to learn from anyone. Don't be full of yourself and thinking you have, oh no, I went to school. Don't trust me. I mean, we're talking about da'wah area here also. If your dad never went to pharmacy school and he doesn't know what the chemical, you know, compositions of that, that's a different story. But we're talking about general ideas of, you know, uh, social life, da'wah, etc., etc. That's what I'm referring to. Also, uh, j always keep yourself with the, with, with the jama'ah. Uh, join the group and abide with their shura. If you are with the jama'ah on a wrong decision, it is better than being solo with the right decision. Because with the jama'ah, with the group, with a, a, a wrong outcome, at least the process is right. But if you go solo and you disrupt the jama'ah, then even if you were tested, Allah sometimes put you on a test to make you feel that you are, oh, I, I know better than them, then you have disrupted the system of shura itself. Put your advice, tell them this is best. But then at the end, وَأَمْرُهُمْ شُورَ بَيْنْهُمْ Last but not least, you have to fear no one but Allah. مَا لَازَمْ تَخَافْ الْإِسْتَعْجَالِ Sometimes rushing into things might be seen as by default people don't fear, but 
not fearing anyone else but Allah should make you incorporate what is the proper thing in that process. When you are free from anyone else's influence as far as they have authority on you in a way that is, you know, negative, you only having God in your, hand, in, in your mind and in your conscience as to please, then inshallah you will land on a better choice and decisions that you are taking. Any questions? Yes. Yeah. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Let me quote it exactly لا يزال يستجاب للعبد ما لم يدعو بإثم As long as he doesn't make a dua with إثم أو قطيعة رحم Allahu Akbar Allahu Akbar I'll give you the paper We'll see you next week inshallah